Shabbat Shalom. So, um, in uh, on the eve of uh, Yom HaShoah, which, uh, tomorrow, right? It's tomorrow. But we, we're gonna we're gonna do something today for this. Yeah, we're gonna do something today for this after service for Yom HaShoah. Um, the question that that was asked and being asked is still the same. You know, how could God allow this to happen? Um, that happens, the, the, the fact that the question remains the same year after year, it means there still hasn't been an answer. Otherwise, we'll stop asking. So I'm going to under promise and I don't know if I'm going to over deliver, but you know, I'm not going to hold you in suspense and say, I got the answer and wait for it. It's going to be given to you at the end of this sermon. <laughs> uh huh. Stick around. That's right. But can we just, the fact that it's just stuck in our brain, you know, that means that we have to search, we have to contend for some type of answer to that question. And the thing is, <laughs> It's ne never in my life did Yom HaShoah seemed as relevant as now, and never before did never again rang so hollow. You know, it's just a declaration. They would be saying, never again, never again. Never. But by, by saying honey many times, it's not going to get sweeter in our mouth. Right? By repeating never again many times, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen again at all. You know, it will continue to happen. The, the, the uh, you know, God, God forgive me, the useless idiots, uh, kids from Ivy Colleges, they will grow up and will run this country at one day. <laughs> well, I hope other kids will grow up too, you know, we'll see. And it's an annoying finger wagging of international organizations and bleeding of the bleeding hearts do-gooders. It will transform over, overnight into a howling of ravenous Jew-hating wolves. Because this is who they are. All these bleeding hearts. It's maddening to watch. Something needs to be done. What to do? is the two seminal questions of Russian revolutionaries, what to do and, and who's at fault. <laughs> what to do? You know, Israel, we look at Israel, it's caught in an impossible balancing act with the two contradictory war goal, goals of you know, freeing the hostages and defeating Hamas. There's a self, they're self, you know, canceling goals. Either you do one or not the other, or the other or not the one. And with the bear-hugging Biden administration who wants them to accept disgrace to avoid a wider war, in the words of Churchill, they will choose disgrace and they will get the war also. What to do? <laughs> in order to know what to do, perhaps you first know, want to know why it happened. So we're back to our original question that I know all of you are asking. I was asking for it. How did God allow? The same question remains. We can offer all kinds of explanations. Why did Holocaust happen? You know, well, it was assimilation. We were assimilated in Germany and abandoned the tradition of our fathers. Well, the fact that we were not assimilated in Ukraine, Poland in the 17th century didn't allow not stop Khmelnytsky from killing millions of Jews, you know? So that is not, <laughs> cannot be the reason. We have, uh, you know, rejected the Messiah. And this is why all these things are happening to us. But it's not just us who rejected the Messiah. Romans also rejected the Messiah. Romans crucified him. It was the Jews and the Romans. They all came together. The leaders of the Jewish people and the leaders of the Roman government came together and, 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 and crucified the, the Messiah. It's the, the Herod and Pontius Pilate in fulfillment of the, of the Psalm 2. Why the nations devise all this kind of wickedness. So, 
and, and, and then generation that says, may his blood be upon us and, uh, and uh, upon our children. It was that generation. And their children, I mean, it wasn't us. It wasn't this. It wasn't like any other generation. It was that wicked generation. That's it. They cannot bind everyone else that comes after them with some kind of an oath. Satan's responsible. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, sin, we live in the broken world. We live in the broken world. Sin is responsible for all these things, okay? All of these kind of questions, right? But God is still in charge. You know, it's this British colonial officer dilemma. I don't know if you heard it. British colonial officer, probably a philosophical dilemma. You know, imagine a British colonial officer in India sometime in you know, 18th century, whatever, 19th century, sorry, uh, witnesses the barbaric custom of the, uh, you know, indigenous people. When the husband dies, they have to burn the wife too, bury the wife too, otherwise he's going to be bored in the afterlife. So she got to go as well. So these are the indigenous customs that need to be respected. And you are the, imagine you are the British officer in charge of the local area. You have soldiers, the red coats. Right? And you can stop all that crazy stuff. <laughs> you just say, no, that's not happening. Right? But who are you, by the way? Who are you to interfere in the local tradition? You know, if you do, there's going to be some kind of a rebellion and all that. So, so you, you want to keep calm and respect the local customs. You know? And by the way, what are you doing there anyways? You, you know, you're some colonizer. You should probably go back to Britain. I don't know. It's like, this is this dilemma. But, so you have the power to, but regardless, you got the power to stop it. I mean, it's, of course, it's not one-to-one -one analogy, but it kind of gives you an idea. God has the power to stop all this. Why didn't he? Regardless of anything else. You know, we can try to explain all these things logically because of this, because of that, because of that. But then that explanation... <laughs> At the end of the day, it's just heartless. It's just heartless because it's not gonna it's not gonna satisfy anybody. It's gonna be like, okay, fine. So you telling me all of these things are happening, it's all my fault and all of that, that's wonderful. It doesn't make me feel any better. And I don't even know if that's true or not, really. Partially perhaps. Maybe then skip altogether explanations and just focus on love. Focus on compassion. You know, love covers multiples of sins, perhaps just comfort. And of course, we, it has to be done. Comfort needs to be done. But it, and, and we actually, comforting is easier than explaining why, perhaps, because at least it's like, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just being there for a person. It's just doing little simple things for a person. Whoever is suffering is to provide, like, just, just, just to be there for them. It's instinctive, you know. We know how to do it. It's not, it's not difficult. And it's, and it's absolutely necessary. It's like this Job's friends you know, situation where Job's friends start there and start offering, offering some reasons uh, for what, this is why it's happening to you as opposed to just being there for him saying nothing. Or, or saying what Elihu said, the fourth friend, who said God knows, I mean, I mean, just be there for them. But still, even when comfort is very important and fundamental, we still want to know the reason why. Because you know why? Because the reason why makes suffering easier. At least you know why. But it has to be the real reason. It has to make sense. It has to resonate. You know, sins is the reason, right? But our oppression did not start with October 7th 
And it didn't start with the Holocaust. It didn't start with Khmelnytsky. It didn't start with the expulsion from Spain and England. It didn't start from the destruction of the temple in Bar Kokhba, uh, from Bar Kokhba rebellion, destruction of the temple. It didn't start then either. It didn't start with Babylonian ex exile. It didn't start there either. It started in Egypt, all the way in Egypt, we were already oppressed. We were oppressed back in Egypt. And in that time, what did we do? I mean, there's, there's a verse here and there that says in Egypt we were like idolaters and we had some idols that we took with, them, with us. But really scant evidence. It wasn't some kind of a, this damning indictment against the people that they were such sinful bunch that they had to be like endure 400 years or 210 years of slavery, whatever you, you look. It, for, it, it, there wasn't such a, you know, in Dibi they had to endure 400 years of slavery there and then. There, they didn't deserve that, especially killing of the babies, of the, of the male child throwing in the Nile. You know, why, why endure that? Just to show that God is so powerful at the end of the day that he brought us out of Egypt with mighty hand, outstretched arm, and, 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 and showed judgment for the Egyptians just like he promised to Abraham and we got out with great wealth. Yes, we did. But what about those that didn't get out with great wealth? What about those that, what about kids that lost the children? How much does the kid cost? <laughs> In Russia, it's uh, 7 million rubles. $70,000. That's what they pay for, the, for, for, for if, you, if somebody gets killed at, in, the, in the war. So, <laughs> depends where you go. Prices differ. Why? You know, God is powerful by the people's expense. Well, okay, fine. That was three and a half years, three and a half thousand years ago. We said we were slaves in Egypt every Passover. We say it three and a half thousand years ago. Okay, whatever. Who feels that? But no, but Holocaust was 80 years ago. And October 7th was six months ago. So all of these things that keep happening. So yes, it is in every generation we feel like that. You know, in every generation they rise up to destroy us. Perhaps, as, as I said before, perhaps because we, we have rejected Yeshua, these things happen. Obviously, rejecting Yeshua is a horrible thing. And the fact that, that we are still far from, from, from Yeshua is, is the reason why he's not coming back and delivering us. Yes, perhaps that is the reason. But again, it was that generation that, that rejected him. All the other ones were presented the message of the you know, good news, or, or it's not news anymore, it's been 2,000 years, perhaps good message, because that's, that's the correct translation of Evangelion, is good message, which remains, but, but it was distorted by the replacement theology and the presentation of Catholics and then some, you know, finger-wagging Lutherans, you know, Protestant people, you know? So how can, you know, how can you blame, you know, for someone who comes with, to you with Nordic Jesus, you know, and says, this is God. And it's like, you know, how can you blame people for rejecting this type of presentation? And now us, messianic, as messianic believers, Jewish and non-Jewish, we come with hopefully a clearer message. And uh, we're rejected off the bat because of all the, you know, just emotionally without even evaluating the message of the good news on its merits. Just emotional rejection because of all the past history. You can, how can you blame them? You can try, but, you know, they also have their reasons. It drives me mad and my heart hurts. So, what do we do? What's the reason? How do we explain? You know, so per Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he spoke through the mouth of Sherlock Holmes how to find out what happened. He was saying if we should eliminate the impossible, then whatever is left, however improbable, must be the truth. So we should eliminate the impossible or at least state something that we know for sure. What do we know for sure? We know that God is good. Just know, God is good. We know that God is just. He is not unjust. And we understand that everything he does, he does for good. And we also know that what we see is through glass darkly, or mirror darkly, and the word in Greek there is enigma. 
So it's not necessarily darkly, it's uh, enigmatically. It's, um, mm, well, not clear. It's a secret, it's still hidden. We, we are subject to an enigmatic situation and we have to accept it as truth. This is the fact. We're not going to know everything. And it says, but these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of them is love. So this is our situation. We're faced with an enigma. So as I was saying, I'm not going to overpromise. <laughs> it's an enigma. And, that's, and that's, the, that's what is known. It's a known fact. The known fact that, that we don't know everything. And it also known fact that how to deal with it is through the three, through the faith and the hope and the love. And that's how we can overcome. Abraham is the first one who believed. And it says in uh, uh, Hebrews 4, 16, it says, For this reason, it depends on faith and trust, so that the promise, according to grace, might be guaranteed to all the offspring, not only those of the Torah, but also those of the faith of Abraham. The promise is the promise of the Mashiach. He is the father of us all, who? Abraham. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he trusted, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence that which does not exist. There is no solution to this Israeli-Palestinian thing. It doesn't exist. There is no good option that Israel has right now in Gaza. They don't exist. All the options are bad options. It's between horrible and terrible. What do you choose? God is the one, somehow, that calls into the existence something that doesn't. In hope beyond hope, Abraham, he trusted that he would become a father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And by the way, Abraham is the father of all Jews and Arabs. Or, you know, however you, you slice it, the people, the, 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 the Palestinians, they call themselves Arabs. They, call, they, they, they see themselves as children of Ishmael, the firstborn of Abraham. So, you know, somehow we all come from the same place. That's why Abraham Accords, you know, that, that, that are there for, for peace, hopefully we'll see it. And without becoming weak in faith, he considered his own body as good as dead since he was already 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet he did not waver in unbelief concerning the promise of God. Rather, he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. He was fully convinced that God, what God has promised, he is able to do. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham, beyond any type of whatever he saw, was irrelevant. Because he saw through glass darkly. Just like us. So whatever we see through glass darkly, I mean, I wouldn't say irrelevant, but it's, it's not the full picture because we don't see all of it. There is something we don't see, and what we don't see, this is where the faith comes in. That's why faith, hope, and love is the remedy of seeing darkly. So real reason why is that God knows what he's doing and we have to trust him. This is not improbable at all and it's a true statement. It's not new, but perhaps it's a forgotten old. We have to remind ourselves constantly of that. Otherwise, why are we so, why am I so mad and upset about everything that's going on? I am mad and upset because I forget this. Because I forget to trust. That's why I'm mad and upset. And Abraham also proven it later on when he offered his son, his only son, whom he loves, Isaac. So when God asks Abraham to offer his son, he doesn't just say, Abraham, offer your son, right? No. He says, take your son, your only son, the one you love, 
Isaac. He does it in a way to make it even harder for Abraham to do this. Not easier, but harder. You know, when someone wants to sometimes speak to you harshly, so they create some kind of an emotional barrier to make it easier for you, for you to do some unpleasant. Not in this case. God shows that this is the one I want you to do. I want you to take something that you love, and I want you to offer something, you, someone you love as a sacrifice. Like that, of course, God stops Abraham from doing so, but this is such an emotional torture. And yet Abraham does it. He goes ahead because he sees beyond what he sees. He knows by now to know God and that God is faithful to his promises. He knows by now that God will somehow do. He doesn't know how, but just like because before when he saw his body as good as dead, what God called something that wasn't to be to be. So in this case, he reasoned God can give him back, give him back from the dead. That's what the book of Hebrews said, that he believed that God will bring him back from the dead. He believed in the resurrection. What? Is anything impossible for God? We know everything is possible. And that's why... <laughs> One of the answers to the Holocaust question, how could God allow it? God will wipe away every tear. Everyone that died unjustly or was dealt unjustly will be recompensed because God is able to do so. He is able to resurrect the dead and to huh, compensate everyone accordingly. So no one would say what have you done? Or you have dealt unjustly. This is what we believe that God can do so. Regardless of how it looks to me now. And, you, and God, just like God told Abraham to offer his son and stopped Abraham from doing so, God offered his own son, right? We know that. God, offered, God loved us so much, he offered his own son. And Israel, being the son of God, just as he says to, to Pharaoh, B'ni b'chori Israel, the, my son, my firstborn is Israel, says God to Pharaoh, God kept, keeps offering Israel over and over again. You think it doesn't hurt him? But God knows how to make up, make up for it. He can. We believe that, and we hope we hope we will see it, even in our days. Because we say never again, it's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. Jerusalem, we know in scripture, Jerusalem will be surrounded by the armies. Israel will be invaded and attacked by the foreign armies of the uh, Antichrist. However you call the person. Anti Mashiach. <laughs> yeah, he'll come. That's because that's how it's supposed to be. This is how it's written. So we shouldn't be surprised. But that's okay. Because we know how it ends also. We know it doesn't end there. We know he loses. We know that we win. We just won't be should be surprised at all of these things when they're happening. It's just a matter of time. And we know that those that died, the Mashiach, they will be resurrected also. We believe this truth and we hope to see them fulfilled. So what do we do? What do we do? In Hebrews 12, 12 through, well, Hebrews 12, 12, it says, Therefore strengthen the hands, he's quoting Isaiah, strengthen the hands that are weak and needs that are feeble. And make straight path for your feet. So that what is lame would not be pulled out of joint, but rather be healed. Whatever is happening with our lame conscience. <laughs> so it's not completely destroyed. And we become jaded and disappointed and abandon the faith, but rather be healed in our understanding. Pursue shalom with everyone. That means Palestinians also, by the way. Doesn't mean do suicidal things, but but be able to be ready to forgive. And holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Not through glass darkly, but face to face. See to it that 
No one falls short of the grace of God and see to it that no bitter root springs up and causes trouble and by it many be defiled. Bitter root of unbelief or sin and so on and so forth. And then later on in the same chapter of 12, 22, it says, but to, to, to explain why, it says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, joyous gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are with, written in the scroll in heaven, and to God, judge of all, to, a spirit, to the spirits of the righteous ones made perfect, to Yeshua, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of something better than the blood of Hevel, Abel. This is what we are come to. Two, this is what is our goal, and this is what we have even now. With having such a great promise, to believe in such a great promise means to see things in perspective and means to trust that God is good no matter how it feels in the, in the present. It doesn't mean we're going to have explanation of exactly why. No, but we can trust that God is good. He knows what he's doing, and in the end, he will recompense all of that is an investment that surely pays off. Invest, to invest is painful. That means you take away from you in the present for something in the future. That is what we have done. We invested blood. But God also invested the blood of his son. So everyone by his blood, our sins are forgiven and we will be restored and redeemed. Today... If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That is the message that we are to convey to the Jewish people. Yes, the message of the Mashiach has been tampered with by well-meaning or not well-meaning people for centuries. You know, do-gooders, they abound. Gotta love them. But we have no other choice. God, maybe we don't see a solution, but God calls the things that are not as if they are. We don't see the way, just like the Jewish people did not see the way in that sea. God made the way. We trust that he will, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And that love is what we can show to those around us and God will do the rest. We trust in that complete, with complete confidence. So don't lose heart, even if it's a Yom HaShoah. Don't lose heart, even if it's Shoah all around. Well, it's hanging in the air, you know. Don't lose heart because of all of these things happen. These things must happen, supposed to. Just don't be caught by surprise. And be ready always to give testimony for the faith that we have in us and the hope that is abound. Father in heaven, we pray, Lord, that we will have opportunities to be your witnesses because you have called us to be witnesses. You have asked the prophet, whom should I send? But Yeshua have actually told us, go, therefore, and make disciples. We have the mandate, the great commission, to go and make disciples from nations and all nations, just like Abraham was the father of many nations, so we are, through the faith of Abraham, can father many children, being our disciples. We pray, Father, that you'll direct us in this path by your Holy Spirit, that we will know what to do, where to go, who to speak to. We pray, Father, for open hearts, open minds of the Jewish people, especially right now. We pray, Father, that there'll be a renewed understanding of the good news by the Messianic movement to present the message of the good news into the ears of the Jewish people in the best clear way possible, unadulterated and unobscured uh, by any type of replacement theology. I pray, Father, that there also be a, an ability to speak and platform or so, something like that to reach as many Jewish people as possible with as clear a message of the good news as possible in this generation. We thank you and bless you in Yeshua's name.